Hello, everyone, and welcome to the MIT Museum. My name is Jennifer Novotny, and I'm our Public Programs Coordinator here. And I'm very excited that you guys chose to spend the first day out of the house after the snowstorm with us here for our soapbox about quantum quandaries and other heavy matters. Um, just by a show of hands, how many people have been to one of the other two evenings in the series? Anyone? Yes. How about both of the other two? Yes. Oh, I'm so excited. Well, thank you guys, even those first timers for coming. I hope you guys enjoy what this evening will entail. We have two wonderful speakers, but before we get into their biographies, I'd like to invite up our moderator for the series, Professor David Kaiser. And pass it off to the person who will do the introductions. Thank you so much. It really is terrific to see you all here. Uh, most of us thought we'd be talking to each other in the corner and no one else would get the message to show up tonight. So thank you for coming. I hope you stayed reasonably warm yesterday and I'm so glad you're here tonight. So as Jennifer was mentioning, this is the third and final one in our series. We've had two, I think, really fun uh, discussions so far and I'm really looking forward to tonight's as well. So tonight we're gonna move uh, beyond the realm of the minuscule and microscopic and look at sort of the vastness of space and then bring it back to wonder does that actually have a, a tie-in to the smallness and the microscopic. So our two speakers uh, today, the first name is uh, Lisa Barsati. Dr. Barsati is a principal research scientist here at MIT. She's affiliated both with MIT's Kavli Institute for Astrophysics and also a member of the LIGO collaboration. As you will hear soon if you don't know already, LIGO uh, stands for the um, Laser Interferometric Gravitational Wave Observatory. They're the group who did find, as we'll hear, um, remarkable evidence in favor of gravitational waves and made that announcement just over a year ago. Lisa uh, completed her PhD in applied physics at the University of Pisa, and after a brief postdoctoral study in Italy, she came to MIT 10 years ago in 2007. Uh, and she, as I say, is a member of the LIGO team. She therefore played a pivotal role with approximately 999 of her closest friends in helping to detect gravitational waves, these tiny ripples in space-time itself, which had been predicted 100 years earlier by Albert Einstein's general theory of relativity. Following Lisa, we'll, have, we'll hear from Tracy Slatyer. Professor Slatyer is a Gerald Zacharias Career Development Assistant Professor of Physics here at MIT. Tracy completed her undergraduate studies at the Australian National University and her PhD at Harvard. She then spent three years as a postdoctoral fellow at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton uh, before joining the MIT faculty in 2013. Tracy's work is at the intersections of particle physics, astrophysics, and cosmology, and her work uh, has focused on trying to understand the elusive dark matter. So we'll hear from Lisa first, and then Tracy, and then we'll have time for lots and lots of questions and discussion. So Lisa, take it away. Hello, everyone. Um, can I be heard? Yes? Good. All right. OK. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about these new messengers from our universe, gravitational waves. Uh, we hope that in the next years, we will learn a lot uh, from our universe thanks to gravitational waves. Uh, before I enter into the detail of, of gravitational waves, let me step back for a second and talk a bit about how we have learned about our universe so far. Primarily, we have used light. So we have built telescopes. I, I'm not sure if you can see it very well. You can. Um, we have built telescopes, and we have got images like this. This is the Crab Nebula in our Milky Way. It's about 6,000 light years away from Earth. Uh, this is the image that you get from the Hubble Space Telescope, and the detector here operates in a visible light. Now, strangely, this is an image of exactly the same thing, and I hope you can still see it. Now you see this purple-looking uh, thing, and this is a different space instrument operating in the infrared. And the even more crazy thing is that this one is an image of exactly the same thing again. And this comes from uh, the Chandra X-ray Observatory, another space detector that operates in the X-rays, right? So the message that I want to give you is that 
the combination of all of these images and so all of these different instruments give us insights of what this object actually is. And that's the, it's like each image itself is not, uh, is not enough to tell us what's happening. And so people who study these things now can tell you that uh, this one here is a neutron star, is a very heavy uh, star, is actually spinning, so we call it is a pulsar. You would have no idea of this looking, for example, just in the visible spectrum. Um, so that's how we have been uh, looking at the universe for 400 years uh, so far. And this is Galileo. This is the instrument that Galileo used. Those are the two uh, telescopes that Galileo built, 16, uh, 1610. There's actually, you can see them in Italy at a museum in Florence. Uh, and this was the first time that Galileo looked at the, at the sky. And those are the instruments that I, I just showed you the pictures from, the Hubble Space Telescope, the Spitzer Space Telescope, and the Chandra Telescope. So in 400 years, we started from just looking at a small patch of the sky with a visible uh, light to a remarkable, those are just a few of the many instruments that we have today for looking at the sky. Now, uh, about 100 years ago, uh, Einstein formulates the theory of general relativity. And uh, there are many ways of describing the impact of uh, Einstein's work, but one is that he essentially told us that there is another powerful messenger to understand how the universe works. It's not just light, but it's gravity itself. Uh, one very elegant way of summarizing Einstein's theory of general relativity is this quote here. Mass tells space how to curve, and space tells mass how to move. The meaning of this is that the space, as we uh, used to think as a static thing, is actually not static at all, can be warped. And if you have very heavy, heavy objects, like our sun, for example, the space get curved by, by the sun. And then the orbits of the other planets are determined by this warping of space. There is even a more remarkable um, intuition that Einstein had, which is that if these heavy objects are in acceleration, you don't just get a static warping, but you get ripples in the space-time. And that's what we call gravitational waves. Another very interesting thing is that uh, entirely based on Einstein's theory of general relativity, you will find that it's possible that there are regions of space where gravity is so strong where nothing can escape, not even light. Uh, and we usually call those places like black holes, right? And so now you start to uh, put everything together. Einstein is telling us that there might be a region in the sky where there is no light coming to us. So we, we, we can't use telescope to actually probe that place. Um, but the good thing is there are gravitational waves, these ripples of space-time that are produced when you have heavy object in acceleration that can tell us about these things that otherwise we wouldn't know. And so now I'm going to show you a movie. Uh, it's a bit dark, black holes, they're black, uh, but I hope you can see it. So this is a simulation uh, of what you would see if you could be right in front of two black holes colliding into each other. And this is the actual simulation based on uh, Einstein's theory of general relativity. So there are no ser observations here. You just do the math, essentially. And Einstein tells you that objects like this could exist in our universe. So you see the black holes are here. Around it, in, you know, to make this simulation more clear, there are all these stars around it, and you see this warping of the space-time around them. And if you look like here, you can see these waves propagating, these uh, ripples propagating here. So now the...
great. Well, I could say, this is wonderful. Uh, actually, Einstein himself thought that gravitational waves wouldn't have really an impact, actually, in physics. For the, same reason, for the simple reason that they are too small. Uh, like the effect, this warping of space-time is too small. Uh, somehow the space is very stiff, even if it can be warped, and so these ripples are very, very tiny. And so Einstein thought in one of the, his latest work, he said that uh, gravitational waves won't have um, any practical uh, impact on physics. Now, several decades after that, astrophysicists and, and, and physics, uh, physicists started actually to put together all these pieces and said, well, wait a second. We just need to build a detector that can measure tiny things. Uh, that's all. And in order to figure out how to measure this thing again, let's use, uh, let's use this video. This is an artistic representation of the, of the thing that I've just showed you earlier. The two black holes have collided. Those are the ripples of space-time, the gravitational waves that uh, propagate through space. Uh, according to Einstein, they propagate at the speed of light. Uh, another image is throwing a rock in a pond. And now, if you solve uh, Einstein's equation, what you would find is that every time there is a you know, gravitational wave pass through space, they stretch it and squeeze space. And so, on Earth, you'd see something like that. Now, the effect was very much exaggerated. You saw the Earth kind of shaking around. Uh, this is a, just to make it clear, the effect is instead incredibly tiny, as Einstein actually predicted. Uh, nevertheless, uh, let's look a bit more in detail what will happen. Um, so imagine, OK. This is me traveling with the wave, right? What I would see in front of me is space stretching this way and squeezing this way. So you are traveling this way, and you imagine that this circle is now determining the plane perpendicular to you that you're traveling top of the waves. This is what you would see. Space would stretch in one direction and squeeze in another direction. And then people looked at this and, and thought, OK, now this stretching and squeezing is very, very tiny, extremely tiny, but I think I know how to build an instrument that can measure that. And the instrument is a Michelson interferometer. So you have a laser source here. This is a beam splitter. This is a mirror that split the laser light uh, in two parts. And those are two objects that are free to move in the, for an interferon. Those are reflective mirrors. So light bounces off the mirrors and come back to you. And now imagine that the circle that I show you is on, you know, on this plane, and the gravitational waves is coming through this and stretching and squeezing space. This is what you would see. This is your laser light. Gravitational waves arrive, and they stretch and squeeze. And so that's equivalent to see this mirror moving that way. Uh, so here it's a slightly more detailed representation. This is the electromagnetic wave of the light of our laser. And what you can do is to set up the position of this mirror such that there is no light uh, leaving the interferometer when there are no waves. And then as soon as the gravitational waves arrive and stretch in the squeeze space, you start seeing some light here. And so the old point is that the change in the interference pattern of light at this output port of the interferometer has encoded the property of the gravitational waves. And the gravitational waves are themselves carrying the information about the source that produced them. So that was the intuition. The intuition was to use laser interferometers to measure this very, very tiny distortion of space-time caused by gravitational waves produced by acceleration of having objects in the universe. 
And so this would be a new messenger from our universe. You could see things that telescopes cannot see. Now, I've been telling you this is very tiny, but let me quantify how tiny. Imagine I'm an object of one meter, and the gravitational wa a typical gravitational wave comes to through me. They will stretch and squeeze me by 10 to the minus 21 meter. This is 1,000th the radius of a proton. This is extremely, extremely small. And so uh, since the original ideas of using laser interferometers it took four decades to actually build instruments so sensitive that could measure this tiny thing. What you really wanted is a magic ruler, right? That you could have and, and try to, to measure it. That it's impossible. You need very sophisticated instruments. These instruments are uh, the LIGO Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatories. Those are two giant interferometers in the United States. Uh, this one is located in Hanford, Washington. The other one is in uh, Livingston, Louisiana. Uh, this is the, your Michelson, the laser is here, and the mirrors that uh, sense the distortion of space-time are four kilometers apart. One is here and one is down there. The twin interferometer is in Louisiana. You can distinguish very well because one is in the jungle, the other one is in the desert. Um, so these instruments have been funded by the National Science Foundation, Foundation in the 90s. Um, in, at the beginning of the uh, 2000, they started uh, to, um, to be built and, and, and installed. There's a huge vacuum system. This is the uh, largest uh, ultra-high vacuum system in the United States. Because you're measuring this tiny, tiny effect, you cannot allow to have air. Uh, in the arms of your interferometer, otherwise the laser beam won't be able to actually sense the space-time distortion. Uh, so those are like huge instruments. The mirrors that I've shown you that moves around, uh, we are on Earth. If you have touched anything to Earth, nothing moves. You're just uh, gravity keeps your mirror down. So you want this mirror to be free to move. And so what we do, is we, we have a very sophisticated seismic isolation system that isolate your mirrors from the ground. So this is a, a giant object. Um, both the LIGO detectors started taking data um, in, the, in the last decade until 2010, and no uh, detection was uh, reported. Looked at the data, there was uh, more than one year of coincidence data of these detectors, no gravitational waves observed. In 2010, a major upgrade of these two instruments happened. Only the, what you see here essentially remained intact. All the components inside the vacuum system, like the way you suspend the optics, the power of the laser that you use, all the technologies was improved substantially, such that the instruments were then able to sense uh, even smaller distortion of the space-time. Um, those two detectors in 2015 came back offline, off sorry, came back online after five years of upgrade of the instrument. Now, these instruments have the uh, peculiar thing that they operate in the audio frequency. So when we saw the change in interference pattern of the, uh, um, in the interferometer, if you can actually play that signal, put the signal, signal on a speaker, and you could hear it. Uh, so when the detectors came online, this was actually after a few days, both detectors were operating properly. Uh, this happened. So now I'm trying to play this. Uh, let's see if this is at the maximum already. So what you will hear is the noise of the instrument first and then you will hear a chirpy sound. And if you can't hear it, I will do it for you. So it will be more fun. The boop, boop. 
that's a chirpy sound at the very end that you, and you, you, you listen to it twice. Let's try again. The first time you hear it at the exact frequency where the signal uh, appeared in the data. And the second time is actually shifted up in frequencies such that it's easier uh, to hear. So this is the same signal. This time you, it's plotted in time. And this is the frequency of the signal itself. Um, and, and, and this is how the signal looked like here. And this is the component in, in frequency, where the frequency increases in a very, very short period of time. This is, uh, this is a, you see, this is just a, a tenth of a second. So it's a very short period of time. So one, you could say 40 years of development of the technology for less than a second of sound. But the remarkable thing here is that what you just heard, let me say it from the beginning, it's the sound produced by two black holes, and, and in a second I'll tell you why we can say that, two black holes that collided in the universe 1.3 billion years ago. And you heard them because, they dis because of the distortion of the space-time that they produced. So this is like, every time I see it, I'm like, wow, this is really incredible. Um, so the point is, be, thanks to general relativity, we can actually calculate exactly what the, what the signal should look like, what the amplitude of the gravitational waves produced by collision of these heavy objects look like. And so by anal analyzing the, the particular signature of this signal, we can say, what the masses of these objects are. Uh, in this particular case, there are two s massive black holes. One is 29 um, uh, solar mass, and the other one is 36 solar mass. So to, all, 30 times the mass of our own sun. Two heavy objects like this that collided into each other to form a third black hole, about 60 times the mass of our sun. And we can tell all of this thanks to general relativity, because you, we can extrapolate very well all this information from this signal. Now, the fact that we have two detectors is crucial here for two reasons. The first one is the effect that you're trying to measure is so tiny that you want to make sure that you don't have some accidental effect local to your instrument that is causing that. So what we do is we synchronize the data from this instrument, and we look at the data, and we need to make sure, and we make sure that this you get exactly the same signal within the window that takes the light to go from one side to another, which is less ten milliseconds. So the window in which these two signals need to appear is very very tiny. The other nice thing about having more than one detector is that you can localize your source in the sky uh, because you, you know that gravitational waves travel at the speed of light. So if you have two detectors, you know it's arriving here this time, here this time, and you can draw an arc in the sky and tell pretty much where it comes from. The more detectors you have, the more, pre the more precisely you can localize the source. So in some sense, Gravitational wave detectors will one day uh, work as telescopes where they can actually tell you exactly where the source is. So this happened, uh, I told you, three days after we turned on the detectors. We almost didn't believe it that this was, was possible. Um, in December, this was September 2015, in December, uh, there was another event, similar, smaller black holes, but similar, uh, similar data. So LIGO so far have detected two uh, collision of black holes. Um, then in January last year, we stopped to upgrade the instrument more and try to make them even more sensitive. And we just started last November to take data again. And we will go through the summer, and then at the end of the summer, you will hear if we have detected more things. But the, the message is that 
This is just the beginning of what we think is a new era in astrophysics. We won't have only light, but we will have gravitational waves as well that tell us about objects in the sky that we wouldn't know about uh, just using light because they are dark. And then, more remarkably, we will also learn more things in conjunction with having telescopes and gravitational wave detectors, because there are very energetic phenomena in our universe that emit a lot of light, but they also have gravitational wave associated with them. And as for uh, electromagnetic waves, as for light, what we will think the future is, is something like this, where we, you have many detectors. Those are the LIGO detectors that are just shown. They are not alone. There are more detectors in, in, on Earth. Um, there is one in Italy where I actually started. And there is one under construction in Japan right now. And one will be built in India. So we will have a network of detectors. Uh, they operate at, at the audio frequency, but the gravitational wave spectrum is much broader than that. And so there are already in existence other instruments that are trying to probe uh, gravitational waves at, at, at lower frequencies. One is LISA, the LISA project, that's trying to measure gravitational waves uh, by building an interferometer uh, in space. And there are many other detectors that are trying to probe uh, uh, much lower frequency. And so this is really the uh, reason why we're all very excited about this, because we believe that this is like uh, Galileo pointing his telescope at the sky for the first time. This is the first time in the history of, of, um, that we have turned on different type of detectors that are opening a complete new window on our universe. Thank you. Okay, testing. Can people at the back hear me okay? Great. All right. So I, unlike Lisa, am a theorist rather than an experimentalist. So I'm going to tell, but I'm going to tell you about one of the big theoretical questions perplexing fundamental physics at present, which is this question, what is dark matter? So this is an ongoing puzzle that we are trying to put together. People sometimes say, oh, you know, we know very little about dark matter, and it's easy to get the impression that this is just a complete mystery. But we actually have several pieces of the puzzle already. We know quite a bit about dark matter, and I'll give you some of the evidence for that in the, um, in the next few slides. So what do I mean when I say dark matter? We've had evidence stretching. The first evidence stretches back to the 1930s, but really the 1970s was when it the issue started to really intrude upon the consciousness of astrophysicists and cosmologists as a problem, we know that about 80% of the matter in the universe is dark in the sense that it doesn't interact with visible light. As far as we can tell, it's not made up of any of the particles that we know about. We do know that this matter appears to have mass and hence gravity. Lisa just gave us a beautiful talk about this new, uh, this new uh, field of astronomy using gravitational waves, but we've been using visible light to try to understand the gravitational properties of objects for much longer. So we know that dark matter gravitates, but we also know that it doesn't appear to scatter or emit or absorb light at all. In fact, you could call it transparent matter rather than dark matter. It would actually be transparent rather than black if you were to have a block of it in front of you and stare at it. Uh, as I said, the rest is really negative information. We just know what is not made up. So the open questions are many. What is this new matter made from? Are we looking at a new particle here, like the Higgs boson that was discovered at the LHC a few years ago, only stable? Are we looking at black holes like the ones Lisa talked about? Yeah, are we looking at this huge population of black holes left over from the early universe? Whatever the dark matter is, where did it come from? Why is it 80% of the matter in the universe? I've told you it doesn't interact with light. Can it interact with ordinary particles at all? If so, how? So first I want to just give you a bit of an introduction to what we already know, why we think this stuff, this dark matter is out there anyway. And then I want to say a little bit about what people are doing to search for it and where my research fits in. So 
first to situate us in the universe. We live in the Milky Way galaxy. This is a photo of the time-lapse photograph of the Milky Way galaxy taken from a point on the coast of Australia, where I'm from originally. That means that we live in a huge spiral disk of stars. We're about um, eight and a half kiloparsecs, which is about 25,000 light years out from the center. So I've drawn a cartoon image on the right-hand side of where the Earth is relative to our galaxy. We, like everything else in our galaxy, is rotating around that center, just as the planets rotate around the sun. Now, it was noticed in the 1970s by Vera Rubin and her collaborators. Vera Rubin was a real pioneer of dark matter. She unfortunately recently passed away. These astronomers decided that they were going to measure the speed at which visible objects, stars and gas clouds, were moving around the center of our galaxy and of other galaxies. Now, those of you who know Newtonian gravity, not even general relativity at this stage, know that if we see a body orbiting around an object like a sun, by measuring the orbital velocity, we can infer the mass of the object that it's orbiting. You can look at the galaxy, you can add up all the stars and gas clouds, and you have a, some idea of how much it should weigh. You'd also expect that velocity of rotation to decrease as you go out further from the center of the system. But what they found, in fact, was that when they tried to measure this, the inner regions of the galaxies look pretty much how they'd expect it. You know, the rotational velocities of these stars and gas clouds around the center of our disk galaxy looked pretty reasonable. But as you went out further from the center of the Milky Way, they expected these objects to slow down, and they didn't. They were traveling just as quickly as the stars and gas clouds closer towards the center. So I'm going to show this little cartoon down here, which hopefully you can see. So this yellow, so, so these, each of these yellow dots here represents a tracer particle propagating in the gravitational field of, um, of, of our galaxy, you can think of it as. So I want you to look particularly at how fast the outer particles are moving. The plot on the left shows what you would expect from Newtonian gravity or from Einstein's general relativity. This far out from the center of the galaxy, we think gravity is pretty weak. It doesn't make very much difference. So you see, in the Newtonian picture, as I said, the points close into the center of the galaxy move fast. Further out, they're just meandering along. But what ha actually happens in reality is that these points in the outskirts are actually moving quite fast comparably to the center of the galaxy. So this is known as the mystery of the flat rotation curves, flat in that they don't change, in that the rotational velocity just doesn't change very much as you move outwards. So that suggests two things. One, the fact that these particles on the outskirts are moving faster than we thought suggests that there's more mass enclosed inside their orbits when we originally, than we originally believed there to be. Secondly, the radial dependence here suggests that it's not just a matter of adding more mass to the center of the galaxy. There needs to be more mass further out from the center of the galaxy than we'd expected. So it's mass that isn't in the same place as all the visible stars and bright gas clouds that we can see. There appears to be something else there. At least that's one conclusion. The other possible conclusion is maybe Newtonian gravity doesn't work very well on the scales of galaxies and other things of that size. So this was one of the first big puzzle pieces, and it touched off a very, in a very interesting and long-standing debate in the community about whether what we were looking at here was some new kind of matter or some modification to gravity. Either would have been super exciting. As a theorist, probably the modification to gravity would have been even more exciting than the new particle. The evidence, however, seems to be coming down on the side of dark matter. So let me tell you a piece of the, one of the major pieces of evidence that changed people's minds in that direction. So now we're going to leap forward about 30, about 30 to 40 years to just about a decade ago. So I'll tell you what the experiment that was done, but first I want to give you a little cartoon. Can we switch the lights now? Because, yeah, the colors on this make this quite hard to see. So the idea here was, all right, if there is some new form of matter around our galaxy, there has to be some reason why it's not clustered like the other matter in our galaxy, why it doesn't follow the spiral disk. So maybe that suggests that it interacts in a different way. Ordinary matter, particles collide with each other, they lose energy, they distribute angular momentum, and they spin down into this spinning spiral disk. If this new matter, this dark matter, hasn't done that, maybe it suggests that it interacts differently. Now, the difficulty with telling apart a new form of matter from gravity in, our, in somewhere like our galaxy 
is, is pretty simple. You know, the matter is going to go where the gravity is stronger. <laughs> so it's hard to tell the difference between from a, from a certain amount of visible matter, the gravity falls off uh, with distance at a different rate. It's different to, uh, difficult to tell the difference between that and simply having more matter that's more spread out. But if you could separate the two forms of matter from each other, then you, could, then you could try to break this degeneracy. You could see the gravitational effects of the new form of matter coming from a completely different region of space to the region where the visible matter is detected. And one way to do that is to look at a system where two galaxies or two galaxy clusters are colliding with each other. Now, the particle physicist's answer to everything is if you don't understand it, smash things together and see what comes out. So this is sort of a very particle physicist approach to the universe, but in this case, we're allowing the cosmos to do the colliding for us. If we imagine that we started out with two systems both consisting of some ordinary matter, which is denoted in red on this, and some dark matter, which is denoted in blue, when these two systems collide with each other, we know what the ordinary matter, which consists mostly of gas clouds, will do. Those gas clouds will ram into each other, they'll exert pressure on each other, they'll heat each other up. And when they heat each other up, that matter will glow brightly in X-rays, which can be seen by the Chandra telescope that Lisa talked about. But the dark matter, if it doesn't interact, those blue clouds of dark matter would just pass straight through each other. They wouldn't ram together, they wouldn't slow down, they wouldn't heat up, and so after the collision, you could imagine that we would have these spots of dark matter out to the sides, while the visible gas was localized in between. And indeed, when the members of the Chandra X-ray collaboration looked at a system of colliding galaxy clusters called the bullet clusters back in 2006, they saw the, they, they saw bright x-rays coming from the visible gas. But they also used a technique called gravitational lensing, which is the bending of light by the presence of massive objects to tell where most of the mass was in the system. And what they found was that most of the mass in the system after the collision was in these regions indicated with blue, these, these sort of sidebands. So it's very hard to explain this just with modified gravity. If all the visible matter is in these red regions, then no matter how fast or how slowly gravity falls off away from those regions, the gravity, you know, the gravity should still be coming from those red regions. Whereas instead, it seems to be strongest in these blue regions, off to the side. So that suggests that we really are looking not at some modification of gravity, but at some new kind of matter. Another piece of evidence, and I'm not giving you the complete picture here, but I'm giving you some of the key pieces of evidence. We have measurements from the very early universe, from when the universe was only, uh, we have, can take snapshots of what the universe looked like when it was only three or 400,000 years old. This is sometimes called the Big Bang Afterglow or the cosmic microwave background radiation. This is what it looks like. This is a map from the Planck satellite made just a few years ago. This is a map of the sky, so with the, with the Earth taken out. We live inside a celestial sphere, so we can project that onto the, into this projection, just like we project the globe onto a map projection. These different colors are showing the temperature at different regions of the sky. The scale on this is, um, the scale of these fluctuations is at the level of one part in 100,000 of the background. So this radiation is almost completely uniform. It, comes, um, it just has these tiny little fluctuations in it, but these fluctuations can give us a lot of information. What do these fluctuations actually reveal? Well, when the universe was 300,000 years old, it was very hot. Um, its temperature was about uh, 3,000 degrees Celsius. So it was very hot. Um, it was very homogeneous, like I just, there, there were, the fluctuations in the universe were at a pretty tiny level. There were no galaxies, there were no stars, there were certainly no people. It was just this hot soup of matter, mostly hydrogen and helium, and photons, and hypothetically, our new dark matter component. Now in this hot soup of matter, sometimes just by chance, you would get a region where there was a bit less matter than the other regions surrounding it. What happens if I have that kind of overdensity? Well, if I have, well, gravity is attractive. So gravity, as soon as I had one of these overdensities, more matter would fall onto it, and it would tend to grow. But if you just have, if your matter at this point is made of 
um, is made of mostly electrically interacting particles, so protons and electrons, neutrons and stuff, when you cram a lot of that matter together, the radiation pressure pu will push it back apart. So the universe consists of this hot soup with these continually shifting, changing fluctuations in density and temperature driven on one hand by gravitational attraction and on the other hand by radiation pressure. But to the degree that you have dark matter present, we've just hypothesized dark matter doesn't talk to photons. It doesn't interact with photons. It doesn't feel radiation pressure. So the dark matter modifies these oscillations by being a term that only feels gravity. Any dark matter that's in the system, it doesn't care about radiation pressure. Any dark matter that you add to these, to these density um, over densities is just going to make them grow. So the question becomes, how would the presence of dark matter change a map like this? Now, a map like this is a little bit hard to pass by eye. So what we often do is we say, OK, we're going to look at um, a simplified description of this map, and we're just going to ask, how much power is there in fluctuations on different scales? How much power is there in very small, in very small scale fluctuations, very localized fluctuations? How much power is there in large fluctuations that span most of the map? That is described in a plot that looks like this. This is called a power spectrum. You don't need to understand the details of it. It's just telling you how much power there is on small scale versus large scales in this map. But what I want to show you is now how this curve changes as I change the amount of dark matter. So this, there's a little purple bar to the right-hand side, which is how much total matter you have in the universe. At the moment, it's just the matter that we know is there, the ordinary matter. As we increase it, the whole structure of this, the whole structure of this curve changes. The amount of power that you have in small scale fluctuations versus large scale fluctuations versus intermediate scale fluctuations transforms fairly dramatically. And this allows us, now it turns out that there's one value of the dark matter abundance which causes this curve to fit the data really well. Now, we don't have, me we don't have measurements of this curve at the level that LIGO does. This is not one part in 10 to the 20 but we do have measurements at percent level accuracy. And that tells us that this fits the data super well, provided that you allow there to be a new component of matter in the universe, something that doesn't feel radiation pressure, that only feels gravity, that is about five times more abundant than all the visible matter that we know about. So this, again, this cuts out a lot of possibilities for dark matter. You might think, oh, well, maybe dark matter could be like old, burnt out stars, just ordinary matter, just in a form that's not showing up to most of our telescopes. Well, this tells you that it's not the case. I mean, this tells you that whatever this dark matter is, it has to be something that when the universe was 300,000 years old before any stars, before any galaxies, it was around, and, it was five, and it, there was five times as much of it as the ordinary matter. There are a couple of other puzzle pieces. Um, we know that the dark matter has to be pretty cold, pretty slow moving. It turns out that we need a significant amount of dark matter that's cold and slow moving, or we wouldn't have galaxies. We would not be here, and Earth would not be here, at least not at the time that it is. So, okay, so I've told you how we got to some of these points, how we estimate the dark matter is 80% the matter in the universe. We know that it gravitates, otherwise none of these signals that I told you about would have been visible. Dark matter for the purposes of the cosmic microwave background, for the purposes of this 80% measurement, is essentially defined by saying we're looking for something that doesn't feel radiation pressure and that doesn't interact with light. And that's enough to tell us already that there are no particles that we know about that can do this. Most of the particles that we know about do interact electromagnetically. The ones that don't, they tend to be unstable. They decay away. We need this dark matter to be something that is still around in the present day. So if it's unstable at all, it has to have a lifetime much longer than the age of the universe. So it's not anything we know about. It's 80% of the matter in the universe. This is a little bit of a problem for fundamental particle physics, just a small hole in our theories. So we'd like to solve this problem. So how do we go about it? So there are three traditional ways to hunt for dark matter, which are called, technically, indirect detection, direct detection, and collider physics. And the idea in the first case in indirect detection is that in many models, if dark matter is a new particle, these all assume dark matter is some kind of new particle, if two dark matter particles collide with each other, they can produce visible particles that we could look at. You may know about matter-antimatter annihilation. This is exactly the same idea, just with dark matter. 
There's direct detection where you say, well, what if I bounce a dark matter particle off a visible particle? Maybe I can look for the visible particle to recoil, to jump, um, even if I can't see the dark matter particle. Or in a collider, like the Large Hadron Collider, if you smash things together at high speeds, as we particle physicists like to do, then, um, then you might be able to produce some dark matter particles. So uh, these are the technical names for these searches, indirect detection, direct detection, and collider physics. Uh, a f colleague of mine also likes to refer to them as break it, shake it, make it. So <laughs> where in the indirect detection case, you break it, you put in dark matter particles, visible particles come out. Direct detection, you shake up the visible particles by bouncing dark matter particles off them, and the collider, you hope to make it. Now, most of my work, which is why I'm here at the Astrophysics and Cosmologist Soapbox, is, got, is focuses on this indirect detection picture, about the question of if dark matter was, you know, if dark matter is some new particle, if it's out there, and if this process can occur, if two dark matter particles could collide with each other and make visible particles, or if a dark matter particle could decay and make visible particles, then how could that influence the signals that we see? Now, my work spans a pretty wide range from theory through to things that sometimes experimentalists would do instead. On the theoretical side, my group's been thinking a lot recently about, okay, we know that dark matter doesn't interact with photons, but what if it interacts via its own force? What if it experiences forces that the normal particles that we know about don't at all? You could imagine forming bound states of dark matter like hydrogen atoms. As soon as you start talking about dark forces, it um, makes this feel very fertile for Star Wars jokes. But um, I'll refrain from, I'll spare you from that this evening. So on one hand, I do this pretty theoretical stuff where we think about, okay, if dark matter were to have these new interactions, what would the consequences be? I also think about the early universe effects of dark matter physics. It turns out that, um, it, it, it turns out that if only a very tiny fraction of the dark matter were to convert its energy into visible matter, it could greatly reshape the early history of our universe. It could heat it up to much higher temperatures than we otherwise expected. It could... Um, take eras where most of the hydrogen is currently thought to be completely in neutral atoms and turn the universe into an ionized plasma. So, so I think about that stuff. And I also think about what signatures from dark matter annihilation might show up in astrophysical observations of our own Milky Way galaxy. Back to that very first picture. So I'm I'll just show you... So I'm very happy to take questions about any of these topics later and to discuss them. I'll just show you a couple of cute things that we've done on the last front. So Lisa mentioned observations at a wide range of wavelengths. I've spent a lot of time over the last few years looking at gamma ray data coming from the Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope. I am not an experimentalist. I just rely on them to give me nice data that I can look at. So this is the Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope at launch, which was in 2008. And using data from this telescope, we can, map, we can make a beautiful map of the sky in gamma rays. So here, blue is fainter, red is brighter, yellow is brightest of all. That big yellow stripe along the center is the disk of our Milky Way galaxy. It's that same band of stars that you saw streaming across the sky in the first image, only now in photons that are about a billion times more energetic than visible light. It's about a billion times more energetic than the light in this room. Now, if we were looking for a signal of dark matter, I said at the beginning that we think, because of these rotation curves, we think dark matter um, is distributed more broadly than the, than the ordinary matter. And to be a bit more specific than that, we now think that every galaxy is embedded in a large cloud of dark matter. So we could look for signals of visible photons appearing to come out of nowhere, but really originating from this cloud. So my collaborators and I have done a fair bit of work at digging into this gamma ray data to see if there's any evidence or if we can exclude the presence of photons from that cloud. It turns out that um, so far we don't think we've found dark matter, but we've found some pretty interesting other things along the way. So I am a particle physicist with a side in high energy astrophysics because we keep finding such neat things. For example, back in 2010, when we looked at these gamma ray data, and we subtracted off a model for the background gamma rays designed to let us see if there was a signal for the, from this dark matter cloud. What we found instead were these large figure eight shaped structures in gamma rays, which are called the Fermi bubbles. 
These, these have nothing to do with dark matter, just to make it totally clear. We found them doing a dark matter search. They probably have nothing to do with dark matter. What they, probably, what they might have something to do with is the black hole at the center of our galaxy. We think that these might be a relic from huge jets erupting from our black hole somewhere several million years in the past and creating these expanding bubbles of hot gas and high energy particles that are producing gamma rays. We then went on in the next few years, we said, okay, we, once we try to understand these bubbles, we can add these into our background model, subtract these off. If we look at the very center of our galaxy, then we see, so here's the center of our galaxy before subtracting our background models. Again, when we strip off these background models, we see this additional gamma ray emission around the center of our galaxy. Now, this could be the signal of the core of a dark matter halo, the dark matter that has fallen into the very center of the galaxy under gravitational attraction. It has, this signal turns out to have a lot of features which argue in favor of that interpretation. But we actually think, based on more, based on more recent work, which again, happy to talk about, but it goes into a bit more detail, we found that actually it looks like this blob, which looks so smooth in this image, looks like it's made up of hundreds or maybe thousands of individual little point sources of gamma rays. So what we may have found here is not dark matter, but some wholly new population of bright gamma ray emitting stars, such as pulsars, lurking around the very center of our galaxy. So, um, while I'm primarily a particle theorist and primarily engaged in trying to understand what dark matter is and design searches that would allow us to look for it, it turns out that when you do those searches for dark matter, you quite often find pretty interesting astrophysics as well. So I'm also happy to answer questions about that. Okay, um, I'll wrap up. I, um, yeah, I, I hope I've given you some sense of why the question of what dark matter is is a big question, some hints of the approaches that we're using to understand it, and a bit of what I do. Thanks very much. Thank you both so much. That was really fun. I, I had fun anyway. I want to start off, um, I have a question for each of you, and that is to, to step back a little bit from these amazing um, astrophysical discussions and discoveries and ask each of you how you got interested in the topics that you now devote most um, waking and not sleeping hours studying. So I'm going to hazard a guess that neither of you were born wondering if you could measure the propagating distortions in the fabric of space-time or equivalent topics for Tracy. So how, how did you, what brought you from very early age to getting excited about these topics to, to here at MIT? Lisa, do you want to take that first? Um, okay. Yeah, my story is, um, well, I was doing physics, uh, studying physics in uh, the university, and I think I was studying physics for the same reason that all my friends were studying physics, which is to discover the law of everything, right? The discover why the universe is um, what it is, and like very deep questions about the universe. And then uh, when I started studying general relativity, I thought, wow, this you know general relativity is like it's not quite that yet, right? Because it doesn't really explain everything, but it's pretty close. And, but I was doing theory, like I, I, that's, that's what I was doing. And then one day the professor uh, was teaching the class of general relativity, brought us to, um, to see an experiment that was trying to detect gravitational waves. And that's a, uh, an experiment that's very similar to the LIGO detectors. It's called Virgo, as in, in Italy. And I realized that Virgo was really in my backyard. It's kind of funny because it's a three, three kilometer L-shaped object that I've never seen, but it was literally seven minutes from my mom's place. And I thought, this is amazing. I can do you know, cutting edge research while staying home. What's better than that, right? And that's how I started. And then um, at that time, 
you know, we were installing these detectors. No one had ever built a detector of this scale. So we were all learning, you know, in US and in Italy at the same time, we were trying to learn how to operate these detectors and that became very challenging. And, um, and that, that's where I am. Thank you, Tracy. How did you start the journey that led you to, uh, to dark matter searches? Well, so I got interested in physics back in high school when I read Stephen Hawking's book, A Brief History of Time, mostly because I was about 12 at the time and all the adults around me told me that it was too difficult to me, for me and I took this as a challenge and uh, went and read it and, and found it really interesting, just the idea that you could essentially that you could use mathematics to describe the universe in this way. So then I think much likely so when I hit university I was interested in you know, finding the theory of everything. Um, when I came to Harvard and throughout undergrad I was interested in theoretical physics. I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I came to grad school at Harvard with the thought that what I had to choose between was doing string theory or being an LHC phenomenologist. When I started grad school at Harvard, the plan was that the LHC would switch on in the next year or so, and then it did switch on and it broke <laughs> initially to the vast dismay of about half my class at Harvard who all wanted to work on the LHC. Now, at, at about the same time, I was running into that problem common to graduate students where you get to the place that you were planning to go for grad school and find out that all the professors who you were planning to work with are not taking students or on sabbatical or leaving to be hired by another place. Um, so I, I had been, yeah, I had been planning to work with either Nima Akani Hamed or Lisa Randall, but Nima, and then I found out that Nima was moving to Princeton and Lisa was going to be away for the next year. So it's like, hmm, okay, this doesn't, <laughs> this is not so good. But very fortunately for me, uh, there was a new young assistant professor in the astrophysics department at Harvard called Doug Finkbeiner, who had been chatting with Nima and Lisa, my putative advisors, about, um, he wanted a student who knew something about particle physics to do dark matter searches. And Nima and Lisa both told him, well, there's this student who's been coming to both of us and going, can I have a project, please? And we both had to say, sorry, we're about to be away. So, uh, so they put me in touch with Doug. And he, he, he shared with me some of the research that he was doing and made the point to me that while everyone in the particle physics community, thousands of people were waiting with bated breath for the LHC to turn on um, and were ready to leap on anything that might come out of that. In astrophysics, there are things that we've, that experiments saw in our galaxy a decade ago, huge striking signals, not two sigma signals or anything, huge striking effects that nobody understands. You know, we've been, the, I mean, like, the data's, in, the data's been there for years, and they're just theoretical problems. Nobody understands where these signals can possibly be coming from. And part of that is that the number of people working on understanding these things is just much smaller than they are in some other areas of particle physics. And it seemed to me that particle astrophysics offered a chance to work directly with data and in an area where there was where both you got to deal with the data more directly because astrophysics experiments make all their data public, whereas particle physics experiments generally do not. So it was a chance to work really closely with data as a theorist and potentially answer some very important questions. So that's how I got hooked on dark matter and particle astrophysics more generally. Thank you, that's great. So we have plenty of time for questions uh, from each of you. I think because we're recording, I'll repeat your question in case um, Jennifer can't get a microphone to you, but feel free to raise your hands and jump right in. Yeah, please, right here. It looks like a microphone's coming. This is a question for Tina. Um, besides in the spiraling of celestial objects and galaxies, what other places do you see dark matter observed? So, sorry, was that, I'm Tracy. Oh, so, I'm sorry, yeah, Tracy. Sorry. T, I got confused. Yeah, sorry, yeah. Um, yeah what, other, <laughs> what other places would you see dark matter? Right, so we now, so, so, right, so, in, so you see them in a lot of, you see evidence for dark matter in a lot of galaxy systems and also clusters. In fact, some of the earliest evidence for dark matter was in clusters, people just trying to measure the mass of the cluster from gravitational effects and also estimate the mass of the cluster from adding up the mass of all the stars and gas in it and finding that they got answers that were different by several orders of magnitude. So that's one example. We also, some of the best, some of the places where people want to
my microphone, I'll just predict. So the Milky Way has many small satellite galaxies around it, which we think are clumps of dark matter left over from early times, left over from when the galaxy is forming. You can detect these galaxies, so these galaxies have a small number of stars associated with them. You can detect these galaxies by looking for the stellar orbits, but because their mass is so dominated by dark matter, it more or less like these stars, looks like these stars are orbiting around nothing. So, I mean, the, the sort of simplest version of the picture is, if I see out in space a star that's just going in circles, <laughs> that tells you it has to be orbiting around something, right? I mean, it's not going to do it on its own. So, the more complex version of that is evidence for a large amount of dark matter in dwarf galaxies. And because they have so few stars and so little ordinary matter, um, you, you can... You, that there's there's good hope for seeing these indirect break it signals of dark matter in those systems. More generally, I mean, we think that there's this cosmic web of dark matter that pervades the whole universe. There's dark matter outside galaxies as well as inside galaxies. There are little clumps of dark matter um, all, all, all over the place. We get indirect evidence for dark matter from the fact that our simulations involving dark matter provide pretty good matches to the observed large-scale structure of the universe. And, uh, and, and, in systems like, and in systems like the bullet cluster or other non-equilibrium galaxy systems, you can quite often see um, nodes of mass, regions where, the, where there appears to be a lot of gravitating mass, but there's very little visible matter. So th there's a huge range of systems where you see gravitational evidence for dark matter. Thank you. Other questions? Yeah, up front. Why aren't planets dark matter? So I'll just repeat the question quickly if I heard you right. Why aren't dark planets uh, considered a significant part? Did I not miss that? Normal planets, why aren't they part dark matter? Ah, oh, so uh, that's an interesting question. So why aren't ordinary planets made of partly dark matter and partly ordinary matter? Did I get that right that time? Yeah, good. Thank yeah, you. No, that, so, well, if dark matter is indeed a subatomic particle, then there's dark matter streaming through this room right now. Um, you know, it, it is some fraction of the Earth. There could be some dark matter trapped gravitationally in the Earth, which would contribute to its mass. But um, likewise for the sun, likewise for stars, every system would have will have some dark matter in it just by accident. And if that dark matter and that dark matter can, and some dark matter can potentially get trapped in those systems. But the reason why most of the mass of the Earth or the sun or something like it is ordinary matter is because we believe and we have evidence from things like the bullet cluster that dark matter interacts only very weakly with itself. It doesn't have an equivalent of the electromagnetic interaction and it's the electromagnetic interaction that binds objects together into atoms and binds um, atoms into molecules and is responsible for a lot of the intense clumping that we see in ordinary matter. So I have a question for Lisa while you all think of your other questions. So we now know this date, September 14th, 2015, when, uh, when the first uh, signal was detected. Of course, it wasn't announced for many months uh, afterwards. I'm curious um, if you can share with us what it was like when you first learned of this signal, because I have many friends on the project. It sounds kind of like James Bond, or it sounds like you know, this was kept under such extraordinary secrecy that you had to really, you know, like carefully vet who already knew and who you could talk to and a raised eyebrow seemed to be that you were in the know. That's my impression as an outsider from the group. Can you share with us what it was like when you learned about this, this potential signal and the process, or at least a, a, a sketch of the process that the group went through for, those, for the months between September and February when it was made public to the world? Yeah, yeah. It was actually one of the, I don't know, most incredible experiences of my life, I have to say. Um, so I told you the... LIGO had just started uh, taking data, literally, we just turned on the instrument. And, um, well, the event happened uh, at night in the United States. Uh, so the, we have um, pipelines that look at the data on, online in real time. <clears throat> so one colleague in Europe was the first one that was working on the pipeline and checking every morning. And so what he did, he wrote an email uh, to the collaboration saying, are you guys doing some tests or are you actually, uh, you know, what we could do is, um, this is something that we, we do to test all the instruments, we can inject signals, right, intentionally. Um, and so he was asking, are, is, is, that, is that what you're doing right now? 
so I woke up in the morning and because I'm uh, the chair for the, for the LIGO collaboration for the uh, run planning, I was checking my phone instantaneous, like the first thing before almost waking up. I would check my phone to check for news. And so I saw this email and I was like, oh, it can be a test because we were not ready for doing that test. <laughs> it's kind of incredible. But we didn't know how to produce a signal like that at that time because we, the system, the infrastructure for actually injecting this um, in the interferometer was not ready. What we do is essentially shake the mirror a bit, right? But we were not quite ready to produce that because our actuators were not strong enough for doing it. So I was 100% sure that it wasn't a test, right? And so then very quickly, uh, you know, I came to the office at MIT and we started talking about, but we collectively, especially people working on the instruments who knew that we were not ready for doing this test, the, the, we very quickly started to think that th this was real. And this signal is huge, like I didn't have time to go through my talk, but the ratio between the signal and the noise combined between these two instruments is 23. It's like, it's not a tiny thing. It's, it's a huge signal. So people have spent the following months trying to see if this could be an artifact. There was no way that this signal is so big that no matter how we tr what we try to do to make it disappear, it doesn't go away. Um, then, um, because um, I don't know if you ever heard, um, so the history of gravitational waves discovery is a complicated history. Uh, in the 60s, gravitational wave discovery was announced and it was not true through another type of detectors. Uh, 2014, uh, the uh, very nice experiment that looks at the imprint of gravitational waves on the, on, on the, on the uh, Big Bang. Um, reported a discovery and that turned out to be not true. So we want to be 200%, 500, 1000% sure that the signal was real. And so we all work for months to check the data, all the additional sensors that we have to monitor local disturbances of the observatory, make sure that there was no correlation with the data we were seeing. I told you in my talk, the signal is to be exactly the same in a very, very tiny window. So that's already a very strong way to reject artifacts. But nevertheless, we checked everything else. And then another interesting thing is that we spent a lot of time making sure that this could not be a malicious mm -hmm. type of event. And there I learned a lot because uh, before this analysis, I thought it was actually possible that you could fake a signal, like I or a group of people who are very close to the instrument could do that. It's actually not true. <laughs> it's really, it was really impossible. Uh, so we went through a very long list of checks and <clears throat> that was an interesting discovery. Yeah. I, I find it really, I, sort of simultaneously amazing and amusing that the fact that you were so early that you didn't even have your um, signal injection pipeline done <laughs> actually you know, made it more believable. You know, normally when things happen in the calibration run, you're like, oh, maybe I trust this, maybe I don't. But, but in, in no, this case, I, it actually removes you know, your potential uh, source of... <laughs> the, in the previous generation of detectors, it was actually, we, this was a standard practice. You right. do these injections, Obviously, you know, they are recorded in every possible channel. So it's not like you can, yeah. oh, oh, wait, I, I injected, I didn't know that. That's essentially impossible because we record every single step of the signals uh, along the chain. But so the point is in 2009 or eight, in the previous round, we used to do that regularly. But then we changed the detectors and our actuators, because they're less noisy, yeah. are also less powerful. And so you can't actually push the mirrors yeah, that okay. way. So that was uh, also a thing that we well, learned. I've, I've heard a story that at one point, like, like you, you were doing this signal inject, this blind signal injection, and most of the collaboration doesn't know whether, I mean, to, to test your analysis pipeline. So most of the collaboration can't know whether or not it's a real signal and you actually got a fair way through writing the paper before. Yeah, so that, so that was an exercise in 2010. Yeah. Um, there, so you don't know uh, if the injection is a, so you, you don't know if this 
particular injection is a blind injection, but you know that you are in a blind injection yeah. period. And wow. so the, okay. that the distinction okay. is subtle, so but it's, it's clear. So grind. in this case, we were not no in chance. a blind injection period for the main reason that we could not make yeah. blind, blind yeah, no, we could not make any type of injection. So, you know, m most experiments don't do this. Like, it's really impressive that LIGO did this, um, that, that LIGO did this setup of basically injecting a fake signal in and then running it through the whole So uh, we say that our, these black holes were our test of the pipeline. Right, yes, <laughs> and it's even better when you see a signal immediately and so you never need yeah. to do the fake signal test. Um, I do actually have a question yes, for Tracy, may please, I ask? Yes. Uh, so a few days after the announcement in February, uh, there are several, at least maybe one paper, uh, the title uh, was a very powerful one, which was, did LIGO detect dark matter? Mm. And there was this theory that, you know, if you, okay, there is this population of black, well, we detected one at that time, but people started to say, okay, if there is one, there must be, there must be a population of this type of black holes out there. And maybe the, those are primordial black holes, so they fit the requirement that Tracy uh, yeah. told us that you, know, you need to have them at the very beginning of the universe. So what's your take on this? Yeah, so this is a really interesting idea. So like I said, I mean, the main alternative to dark matter being some kind of new particle is that maybe it's some kind of black hole left over from the very early universe. There are sort of two regimes that could work for this. One is really, really tiny black holes. Black holes smaller than our moon. Now, so if you want to use that explanation, then I mean, that works in the sense that it's not ruled out by any, um, by any experimental constraints. But you have to explain how you made black holes the size of the moon in the early universe. You know, the way that we get black holes in the late universe is that stars explode and collapse on themselves and make black holes, keyword being stars, and stars that are significantly bigger than the sun. So that's not going to make a moon-sized black hole, but maybe you could get them out of some early inflationary period, which Dave studies. But then there's this totally different mass range, which is the mass range of like 30 solar mass right. black holes that LIGO found. The question is, could they be dark matter? Um, it seems... It seems maybe possible, but tough. There are a number, mostly because, I mean, the idea is fine, but there are a number of experimental constraints on black holes in this mass range making up all the dark matter. If you, if you have black, an, enough black holes scattered around the region around our galaxy to generate all the dark matter to be responsible for those modified rotation curves that we saw back in my talk, then you would generally expect them to have other effects, like as they moved through um, as they move through systems of stars that were only weakly gravitationally bound to each other, those systems would just fly apart when something that was 100 solar masses flew through them. Now, the loophole is that, depending on which analysis you look at, everyone agrees that black holes more than 100 solar masses in mass are ruled out as making up all the dark matter. And everyone agrees that black holes below about five solar masses in mass are ruled out as making up all the dark matter. Uh, that's a different search. That's if one of these black holes were to move between us and a distant object, the gravitational bending of light around the black hole would cause the object to like wink brighter for a short period of time. And there have been searches for those little winking effects, and they didn't find anything, or I think they saw one event, so, um, which might have just been a fluke. So everyone agrees that below five, bet between about moon mass and five solar masses, and from 100 solar masses up, it's ruled out. And then there are some papers that say that this range in between them is also ruled out, but it's a much smaller number of papers. And the constraints are sort of much more tenuous. So maybe, yeah, maybe if like 100% of your black holes are all 30, if 100% of your dark matter is like five, is like 10 to 100 solar mass black holes with not many at lower masses and not many at higher masses, then maybe, maybe they can be all the dark matter, okay. sort of marginal. But, um, I mean, it would appear to be in some tension with some constraints, but maybe those constraints were calculated wrong or whatever. Well, I wouldn't say it's totally ruled out, but it seems a bit hard. And if you've got, I mean, and then you need to explain, like, why are my black holes all in this mass range and not heavier or not right. lighter? Yeah, but it, yeah. but it, it, it could be. It would be amazing if true, if LIGO also detected that. Yeah, no, when well we saw it, this is not waves. part of the so, LIGO. Right. This paper didn't come from the LIGO no, 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 collaboration, no, came from outside. But, so. but it would be pretty amazing if like, LIGO in one like, event managed to simultaneously to yeah. come up with two huge questions in fundamental physics.
Yeah, question right back here. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, let me just quickly uh, repeat yeah. the question for the, for the recording. It's a great question. So the question was, uh, as Lisa had reported, um, the, the chirp, the, the, fam the now famous signal that LIGO uh, detected, uh, from that chirp, Lisa said that the team could determine the masses of each of the objects. These black holes were each roughly 30 solar masses, uh, and also their distance from us, so uh, 1.3 billion light years away. So the question was, how, where does that, how do you know all that? You yeah. have one chirp or two that line up so beautifully. How do you get from there to these very concrete quantitative statements yeah. about the no, source? That, that's a very good question. So the short answer is all comes from Einstein uh, theory of general relativity. Because you can actually model these systems very accurately. And so what happens is the way in which we actually search for uh, signals like this in our data is by building a template. So you run your code, and you produce uh, signals like this, and you go from you know, one, one uh, solar mass, two, two, one, two, all a big, a big grid uh, of all of these parameters, right? And from that, you're actually matching. The, it's a matched filtering technique. So you match your data with the templates. And the one that match better is your, is your uh, signal. And then the amplitude of the, this is all, te, all uh, general relativity, the amplitude of the signal that you see gives you a uh, distance. It's a, it's a, we, we call it um, uh, like a, a standard siren in, in the sense because it's, a, it's an accurate measurement. And then uh, the fact that we have um, two detectors. Uh, I was trying to explain in my talk. So you know like the source is up here, right? And you know that the gravitational waves travel at the speed of light. And there is a fixed distance between the two observatories. So the light from this source needs to arrive here, and then you can measure at the t when it arrives there. And, and you can imagine you have uh, you know, like a wire like this, and then you move this around, right? But at, uh, and then you can constrain where it is in the sky, just basing on the timing of the signal arriving on Earth. And so it's quite remarkable, but um, because of these things, from that fraction of a second thing, you can learn all of these things. Once we will have more detectors online, not just the two LIGO detectors in the United States, but the one in Italy, the one in Japan, then the one in India, you, the, the accuracy on which we can actually point in the sky will be, will be way better than now. And that's crucial because what we think we would do is to say, OK, we have seen a trigger now, and we, we are doing that now. We, we tell telescopes, point your telescopes in that part of the sky. Because if this event also had light associated with it and not the gravitational waves, we'll see those two things at the same time. But now we are telling the telescope pretty much over there. And it's a wide, quite of a wide fraction of the sky. And so hopefully in a few years, we can just say way more localized area. And so that's when the we call it the new era of, of multi-messenger astronomy will start. So there's a question all the way in the back, and then I'll come to you next. Yeah. Yeah, I was, uh, I was wondering the data from Voyager missions, is that any useful for uh, gravity waves or dark matter? So can you say uh, the, the emissions from what? I missed the... Oh, oh, good. So the, 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 the probes that were sent that have now basically exited the solar system. Yes, yes. So the so question is, do, does any data from the Voyager 1 or 2 probes help with any of the kinds of investigations that you've talked about tonight? Um, so I haven't seen much direct use of that data, but I know that um, I, I'm just trying to remember. I think um, there was some information when, the, when one of the Voyager probes passed out of the solar system a few years ago on um, measurements of what happened to the cosmic rays out there. So in the kind of 
in the kind of analyses like this one that's still on the screen behind me, it's really critical to understand how to subtract the photons that are coming from ordinary non-dark matter processes. The main process that photons at this energy are produced by in our galaxy is by high energy charged particles, cosmic rays, uh, interacting with the gas and producing gamma rays. So it's a sort of constant challenge in this work to try to get better models of the cosmic ray distribution in our galaxy. So like in indirectly, just understanding what the cosmic ray distribution looks like outside our solar system could potentially feed into that background modeling. There was a much earlier use, I believe it was of the Voyager probes, uh, a few years after they'd been launched, to actually try to test the fundamental theories of gravity that itself. Oh. Uh, that, was, that was Voyager, I think, right? So there were ways to constrain alternatives to Einstein's general theory. Yes, so not just good. Newtonian gravity, not just general relativity, but a family of alternatives that would look kind of like but quantitatively distinct from general relativity. And measurements, I believe, with Voyager are certainly similar interplanetary probes. By the late 70s, we were able to say if it's not exactly Einstein's theory, then it's something awfully close. The other theories yeah. that modify gravity have to be very tightly constrained, and that was a very early uh, yeah, dividend no, that, that, for those, that, that, That's for those true, yeah. So these theories of modified gravity that I was talking about, they were constrained by these solar system bounds. You needed to have a theory which reproduced Newtonian or Einsteinian gravity extremely well at solar system scales, and then looked totally different at galactic scales, and then looked like Newtonian or Einsteinian gravity again at cosmological scales. So it, it needed to be quite, um, needed to have some special properties. That's right. So last question here, yeah. It's a great question. So the question was, if, if gravitational waves move at the speed of light, which they certainly seem to, and if they carry all this information, as Lisa said, she learned all this information from the particular signal of those waves they detected, could one produce gravitational waves and use those as a kind of telegraph signal? Could you send messages encoded in gravitational waves? I would love to see the grant proposal for that. That would be a little expensive. I believe there has been, actually, in the past. Okay. Um, a grant proposal, not a detection. Uh, <laughs> um, so, not really. I mean, it's a, in, in principle, it's a cool idea uh, because, you know, gravitational waves have this nice property that they, not, they don't interact with things and so they can't get scattered and so you would be quite advantageous. But in order to produce uh, gravitational waves like the one that LIGO described, uh, for this tiny, tiny 10 to the minus uh, 21 strain distortion, the amount of energy that you need is huge. And when I say huge, I really mean huge. So it's the, the uh, space time is extremely stiff. So in order to be able to produce this wave, you would, it, it's not, uh, you, won't, you won't win in the sense that you have to put so much energy in that at you, that need, point, you need to get a couple of 10 solar mass black holes yeah, and smash exactly. them together. So, so the waves it's that... Not very it's not a very efficient process, let's put it this way. It's a wonderful idea, and it's the sort of thing that I think Tracy and maybe I and some of our students would enjoy playing with, because it's theoretically certainly well, uh, one, could, one could pursue that. But the practicalities are, I mean, the, the collision that, that Lisa described basically dissolved in a tenth of a second three times the mass of our sun into raw energy. And it showed up as this incredibly minuscule little wave that they uh, yeah. somehow miraculously discovered with their enormous four kilometer long detectors. So, yeah. so it, it's an effect that really should work, but it's it, like Lisa's saying that the, um, if you imagine space as a kind of spring, it's just this, the, the stretchiness is so limited. You just, it's hard to, to make that spring, set that slinky into motion. Yeah. Um, but it could happen, it could be done, I just, I can't do it. <laughs> well, I wanna thank um, Lisa Barsati and Tracy Slatt, I wanna thank you all coming, for coming out uh, the day after our latest blizzard, um, and uh, come back to the museum other times. Lisa, Jennifer, do you have other closing announcements? One quick one, so we're handing out a quick survey. Um, so if you guys would be so kind as to fill it out. If you fill it out and put your name at the bottom, and if you fold it in half and turn it into us, we're gonna do a quick drawing for a pizza pie cutter. Um, so we were supposed to celebrate Pi Day yesterday, but we're celebrating it today. We're calling it a rounding error. And so the winner of our drawing will get a nice pizza pie cutter. Um, so if you'd be willing to take a couple minutes, it's 
half a sheet, it's really fast, and it just helps us um, better understand events like these and hopefully help get you guys to want to come back to more in the future. Um, so while you're filling it out, let me also encourage you to come visit us for other events at the MIT Museum. Um, in April, we are hosting the Cambridge Science Festival. Cambridge Science Festival runs from April 14th through April 24th, and there are 10 days, about 180 different activities, all science related throughout Cambridge for future scientists, current scientists, people who like science, people who don't even like science. Um, so you should check it out. Uh, one event we're hosting is a premiere of a play called Both And, uh, which is a play about quantum physics and explaining the basics of quantum physics. And so that's a collaboration between us here as well as the Central Square Theater as part of the Catalyst Collaborative at MIT. And so we are premiering that here during the Cambridge Science Festival. If you want to see us between now and then, though, we have quite a few other events, uh, so consider joining our email list. Um, we'll take a couple more minutes for surveys, uh, but thank you all for joining us, and hopefully we'll see you in the future. <laughs>